I'm delighted all of you could come out uh, on such a beautiful day because I think uh, the effort will be well worth it. Uh, we are very fortunate to have Carl Wyman uh, deliver this, uh, this name lecture today. And uh, for any of you who have, have looked at his uh, bio, it's a rather interesting one. Uh, he grew up in the old growth forest of uh, Oregon and had what one might call an idyllic childhood, uh, more dependent on books checked out from the library than from television. Uh, I think maybe a message for all of us, especially those of you who are fans of American Idol. Uh, <laughs> you should be going to the library. Uh, he left Oregon to uh, begin an undergraduate program at MIT, probably uh, a rather stunning achievement given his background. Uh, after being in the old growth forest for a while, he did move to the booming metropolis of Corvallis. Uh, and he was very fortunate to connect with a friend's father who was a math teacher uh, on the faculty at Oregon State. So he got a little encouragement along the way, and uh, a love of physics was born very, very quickly. Uh, after MIT, he felt that there were a lot of uh, pulls back to the West Coast, and he completed his PhD at Stanford. Uh, with just a short interlude, uh, with the exception of a short interlude, his career was largely spent at the University of Colorado. And I think uh, all of you know, and Bob was kind enough to mention, that he received the Nobel Prize in 2001. And if you look at the picture of uh, Professor Wyman and his collaborator, Eric Cornell, they look like graduate students who have just given a poster. I mean, they look like maybe they're 27, 28. So something uh, tells me I haven't been living well. Uh, but what a stunning achievement, and what a stunning turn of events that uh, someone who has reached the pinnacle of physics research devoted a good bit of his prize money to an endowment to support the teaching of physics. And this love of teaching and doing it well has grown into something much more. It's now a hard look at the way we teach undergraduates about science. Uh, unfortunately, I think for Colorado, and one could argue for uh, the US, Professor Wyman moved to the University of British Columbia in part because of his frustration with not being able to attract funding to support his work in the science of teaching science. Um, if you look at an interview that was published not too long ago, he tripled his uh, career total of proposals that were rejected for research work uh, in the EHR division of the National Science Foundation to support work on uh, teaching. What you will experience today is a person at the peak of his career who is now looking at how all of us engage students in large lecture classrooms. Uh, show me a, a university with more than a few thousand undergraduates and I'll show you science taught in large lectures. And yet we don't really think about the people in the audience until the end of the semester when they're asked to fill out course evaluations. So you're going to hear um, about a more dynamic experience that engages lecturer and students in very creative ways. It's my great, great honor to introduce our speaker today, Carl Wyman. Okay, well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and I, I have to say I've given a lot of endowed lectures, but this is the first uh, endowed lecture for physics teaching that I've ever done, so it may be the only one in existence. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is really taking a, a scientific approach to teaching, uh, you know, particularly physics. I could have made this really physics-oriented, but I was pretty confident there's going to be 
reasonable number of people from outside of physics, so I'm, I'm kind of making it more general, although everything I say certainly applies to physics and has lots of data from it. I hope others will see it applies to many other subjects as well. Now, before I get started talking about this, though, I, I want to make one thing very clear, is that you shouldn't give any credibility to this because of the fact I have a Nobel Prize. I mean, when you get a Nobel Prize, you suddenly become an expert on everything, no matter how little you know about the subject. Um, and that's particularly for, true for teaching. But the reason you should pay attention, and have, this should have some credibility, is everything I'm going to say is backed up by lots of very solid data from people all over the world. In fact, uh, there's more than a respectable group right here at Vanderbilt uh, who does some, some of this research on science education uh, work that I'm going to talk about. Uh, so most of the work comes from other people, although um, if I lost the pointer here, I, I should point out that I actually for quite a number of years have had my own science education research group uh, and so some of, the some of the data will come from my group as well. So what I'm going to talk about, and the idea of using the tools of physics to teach physics, um, first quickly review why science education is important, and then look at what some research tells us about teaching and how people learn, and then some technology that can help implement this improved learning in classrooms. Uh, and then probably I won't, it'll be too late uh, to say much about the last category, which is really what I'm focusing on now, which is how to get these methods into every classroom. So the first start out by just thinking about what's, what's the point of science education? And I think it's, it's important to realize that the purpose has really changed significantly over uh, roughly the last half century. And because before that time, it was really primarily, see if this, oh good, I need to show it here without, um, it was producing the next generation of scientists. But there's been two big changes in society that's changed the needs for science education. The, the first is that we have these enormous global scale issues that mankind's now facing uh, that are fundamentally technical at their heart. Uh, you know, global warming, genetic modification, and so on. And we need a much more scientifically literate uh, population if they're going to make wise decisions on these really critical issues. And then the second big change is the economy. The modern economy is so based on science and technology that really, independent of occupation, one will be more successful if they've got some technical literacy and complex problem-solving skills. Um, they'll be more successful as individuals, and frankly, the economy itself will be more successful if there's more of those folks around. And so because of these two big changes here, it means that we, in science education, we really have to be thinking about it uh, as making it effective and relevant for a large fraction of the population, not just those, that tiny fraction that's going to become the next generation of scientists. Now, that doesn't mean we can neglect that. And the, the good news is that at all the research says that if we do this, if we, make, if we accomplish this purpose, we'll actually produce more and better scientists at the same time. So it's nice that it's not an either-or uh, situation at all. Okay, so this is what I say the, the modern purpose of science education is. But you may be already thinking, well, aren't we doing reasonably well already. We're producing scientists and engineers and doing all sorts of things. But I, I want to emphasize that, you know, if you use that same standard of success, we'd still be getting treated with bloodletting. You know, most people come in sick to a doctor and, uh, 200 years ago and they'd let out a pint of blood, they'd go away and they'd come back healthy, you know. 
a lot more successful than what happens in a typical physics class, how many uh, do well. But my point is that that just isn't an adequate standard anymore. We need to ask not, you know, does it work for some people, but does it work for all people, and what can we, and more important than that, can we do better? And so, uh, you know, that's what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm saying we need to make science education effective and relevant for most of the population. That gets to the point of, well, what do I mean by an effective education? And what I would argue is that it's really transforming how students think so that they come into our classrooms like that and we really want to have a transformation. See? Uh, okay, now admittedly for most students it won't be quite as dramatic as these two turning into scientists, but I would argue that a, a reasonable standard should be that at every course or program we want to have the standard should be that the students will think about and use science more like a scientist. And that's really the standard that I'm going to use as I evaluate how well we're doing and how one might do better. Um, so, you know, the hypothesis that I'm really putting forth here is we can make this much more effective science education, uh, but only if we approach it the teaching of science like science. And I'll give four particular things which are, which are really a fundamental part of all experimental science and largely responsible for why science has made such dramatic progress. And I want to argue that these can be equally effectively applied to, uh, to teaching. The, the first is is practices that are based on good data and objective, you know, standards of evidence as to what works. Uh, in this case, you know, what are students really learning? Um, rather than tradition and anecdote and sometimes superstition that guides so many teaching practices, frankly. Uh, the second is you know, guide what we do by fundamental research uh, or, you know, principles that come out of that. In this case, in the education aspect, it's research on principles about how people learn, how the brain works. The third is really disseminating the results in a scholarly manner so that one can find out what works and copy it and build, progress from there like we do in all our science research. And that finally just you fully utilizing modern technology. Like I say, any scientist will recognize these are just a normal part of how we do science and I'm going to try and convince you in the rest of my talk that they should be a normal part of how we approach teaching of science as well and they'll be equally effective there. Um, okay, so I'm going to start ta talking now about some research and what does it tell us about effective science teaching, uh, but rather than just jump into the story, the, the data on this, I'm going to set it in a little context of how I came to see this, uh, you know, and how I changed my views on education. And it really starts with uh, when I was first called upon to teach physics many years ago. Um, at, at Michigan, uh, you know, I did what's pretty much kind of a human nature when you go to teach anything. I would sit there, you know, this was introductory electricity. I'd think about the subject really hard and I'd get it figured out in my own mind really clearly so that then I could go in to my sophomore students and explain it to them so they could understand it with the same clarity I had. Okay, that was a reasonable idea, but I've always been a hardcore experimentalist, which means I kind of measure, believe in measuring everything. When I measured what my students were really learning, I found out that my beautifully clear explanations were leaving the great majority of them just quite baffled. And so I thought, well, maybe it's just me. I'll go and measure how much they're learning from all these more experienced teachers. And I found that it really wasn't much different. 
And so for many years, this was just a frustrating puzzle to me. You know, just something just didn't seem to work. Maybe it couldn't work. But the way I actually came to make progress on this was actually from looking at graduate students. Because I had a, you know, a big atomic physics group for many years and spent a lot of time and attention on looking at the graduate students and their development. And frankly, that's one of the keys to my success is good graduate students do good research and I get famous for it. So anyway, um, but there was something that after, over the years emerged as a very consistent and strange pattern. These students would come in to work in my research lab and they, you know, these were six, top of the line physics graduate students. So that by definition, they'd had 17 years of great success in court classes. And yet, when come to do re physics research, they were really pretty clueless about how to even approach it and do anything. But after just a few years working in the research lab, they'd suddenly turned into expert physicists. And you know, if, if I'd seen this happen once or twice, then I'd think, well, it's just something funny about that person. But over the years, I saw this was really the norm. It's a very consistent pattern, see, over and over again. And after a while, I said, hey, this, there's got to be something fundamental here about this that I can be understand and, and explain this consistent pattern. And so I, you know, started to think, okay, I got to treat this like a science problem and really try and get to the bottom of this. Now, one hypothesis that came to my mind and comes to other people's mind who think about this, who've seen this, is, well, maybe it's just that the human brain has to go through a 17-year caterpillar stage here before it can, you know, suddenly transform into a physicist butterfly. Um, and this is a plausible hypothesis, but I, you know, wasn't completely satisfied with that. And so I really started to look much more deeply and systematically at the research on how people learn, particularly how they learn science and physics, uh, to make sense of this. And what I came to realize is that, no, that wasn't the explanation, but that in fact this pattern I saw so consistently made perfect sense and in the process of understanding that, it made it clear to me um, the tremendous opportunity there was to improve how students learn in undergraduate science. And so I'm going to go, th and really that arose from, uh, and I think this, this really compelling picture arises because of research coming from three quite different areas, but they really paint a very consistent or self-consistent pattern that, uh, that fits together from classroom studies to brain research to cognitive psychology. All they, they all really support uh, this clear picture of certain key elements that are critical for achieving learning and that explain why I was seeing the kind of things I did with graduate students and the undergraduates I was trying to teach. And so I'm going to give you a sense of, of some of that research and what we learned from it. So I'm going to talk about first uh, just research on traditional science teaching, primarily physics, um, and then looking at some cognitive psychology research that explains those classroom physics, university uh, physics results uh, and provides some underlying principles of guidance. And then I'm going to look at some research just on effective uh, teaching practices and you'll see how those fit in how this actually fits in extremely well with the principles coming out of cognitive psychology. So try and so you can see how this is really a, a nice, consistent picture. Um, OK, so I'm going to look at first traditional science teaching, as said in the introduction. Uh, I think 
it's all over the place. I think it's pretty, everybody's pretty familiar with it, with it. What I mean by that is that the primary contact between instructor and student is in the form of the instructor up here giving a lecture to a largely passive group of students. Busy yawning, uh, Norm. Uh, he's cued to do that. I'm sure that's the whole reason. <laughs> um, and then they go home and they do, you know, homework problems in the back of the chapter in the textbook and have kind of similar exams. And so this has been started to study more and more as to how much people are really learning from that, particularly uh, in physics. And so I've picked three intentionally very different aspects of learning. The first is just transfer of information in lecture. Second is development of a conceptual understanding. And the third is basic beliefs about physics and chemistry. Uh, and I, and I want to point, say that just in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to present data where the, there's the most in it, uh, from and most consistent. Uh, which is from, largely from introductory physics, but I, I will say that we have a growing amount of data from a variety of other subjects uh, and other levels that all are completely consistent with the conclusions I'm going to show here and the data. Okay, so start with retention or transfer of information from lecture. I mean, if you think about a lecture, it's primarily the idea is to take information from one and transfer it to many. It's actually very easy to test how well that's working. And there's lots of uh, formal studies. I'm going to give two real simple ones that anybody here who's giving a lecture could repeat uh, if you had a strong enough stomach. Um, and the, the first one is from Joe Reddish. Uh, as many of the physicists here know, Joe is a physics professor at the University of Maryland. And he's a very acclaimed lecturer, um, but, you know, was rated very, very highly by his colleagues and the students. But Joe's a thoughtful guy, and he started wondering how much his students were really learning from these lectures. And so he hired a physics graduate student to just stand outside the door at the end of the lecture and catch students at random and, and ask them uh, to explain the lecture you just heard. What was, what was it about? And what he found out from this consistently that students could answer only in the, the vaguest of generalities, almost no real information. Uh, similarly, in some little studies I did with Kathy Perkins, after the students had been given some important but non-obvious fact in the lecture, we'd just test 15 minutes later as to how many of them had that, remembered it. And what we saw is about 10% would actually still remember these 15 minutes later. Um, and there's lots of other studies, like I say, with various degrees of formality that give similar results. Now, you know, you ought to be, you hear this, you ought to be kind of thinking, my God, we've got thousands of lectures going on like this. Is it really true that such a tiny amount is being transferred? Is this really a generic result? And what I would argue is that the Cognitive psychology research says that this is just what you would expect, and this is quite generic. And the, the reason I say this is because of the, something that they've talked about in terms of cognitive load or cognitive capacity, which is probably the best established empirical result from cognitive psychology and the most widely ignored in teaching. Um, and it's this Gary Larson cartoon uh, nicely represents it. And it's really just the idea that the, the part of the brain that remembers and processes information on sort of a, a short time scale, it's called the working memory, uh, has an extremely limited capacity. This is in contrast to the long-term memory that has a very large capacity. Um, and in fact, the, the working memory is, is very analogous to a, a PC with very limited memory. And so the more it's called upon to do, more windows you open, the more everything slows down and gets bogged down. And so um, 
th this capacity is actually can be reasonably quantified. Um, and, you know, the cognitive psychologists in their labs, it's, it's a little fuzzy, but they talk about, you know, it can remember a maximum of, of around seven unrelated items and can process a maximum about four ideas at once. Like I say, those get a little fuzzy in trying to translate an item, an idea, into what the physics, you know, a physics lecture. But what is very clear is that this capacity is tiny compared to the amount of new information and processing that a student in a typical science lecture is being called upon to do. And so it would be astonishing if they were retaining anything but a very small fraction of the information unless they already knew it, in which case they didn't learn anything in the first place. Okay, okay well, but this is just retention of information from a lecture. You could argue that's not really terribly important learning. And so would I. And in fact, one of the main reasons I put this up is simply to convince people that they aren't really learning anything when you're just spewing information out to them anyway. So there's more effective ways to actually use that lecture time. And I'll get to that later. Uh, oh, and I should say, because I also know that you all have brains that depend on working memory, and I'm going to likely exceed it. Um, i using artificial long-term memory here, and I'll make sure that Robert gets copies of my PowerPoint slides somewhere if people want to get them later. Um, okay, so let me move to another really more important aspect of learning, uh, the understanding of concepts. We all physicists know that one of the great strengths of our discipline is that we've got these really general concepts that apply in all kinds of different situations. And so there's been a lot of research in the physics education community looking at how well students are really learning these concepts. And out of these studies have come some very good tests that can be given to students to, to find out, okay, how, do they ma how well have they mastered, how well they understand and apply the concepts we're teaching. The, probably the, the oldest and still most widely used, although there's been improvements on it, is something called the, the Force Concepts Inventory. And this came out of studies of student learning of the basic concepts of force and motion covered in every first semester physics course. Usually by asking students to apply that conceptual understanding to some simple real world situation like a car running into a truck or here's, here's one example of a you know, ring sitting on a table and there's a, a bead rolling inside it, what directions it go when it comes out, okay? And as many of you probably know who used this, um, the, the way this is used is it's, this test is given to the students at the beginning of this, this semester and then it's given at the end of the semester and one looks at, okay, the, what fraction of the questions they got wrong at the beginning, so the things they didn't know, did they get right at the end? That tells you what percent they learning they got, what they gained. Uh, and this is used now very widely across the world. Uh, every semester. And when you do that test and you ask what, what's, the pers you know, what's the average over the whole class of the average amount learned that they didn't know at the beginning, you get a very robust result. And this is one compilation of average, a histogram of averages of what's in this plot, 16 different traditional lecture courses here. And the scale might be kind of hard to see, but the thing that's really uh, dramatic and important is that the traditional lecture course simply never gets a gain of higher than, or even as high as 0.3. And so the students just, of these critical concepts, they just never learn more than as 30%, and in most cases, the average student's well below that. Um, the thing that's, that's so remarkable about this result is it's consistent across different institutions, Harvard University, community colleges, 
big classes, small classes, great lectures, crummy lectures. It says that there's just a fundamental problem with the pedagogical approach. It's not effective for student mastering concepts. Okay, um, so now I'm going to jump, so that was conceptual understanding. Now I'm going to jump to something that's very different. It's general beliefs about physics and what it means to learn and solve problems in physics. And we've done the comparable thing in chemistry as well with similar results, but I'll just focus on, on physics. Um, so if you interview a whole bunch of people, you find out their beliefs on these general areas lie on a spectrum from novice to expert. And let me, if I define those, you'll see what I mean by these beliefs. So to a novice, the content of physics is just a whole bunch of different isolated little pieces of information and the way you learn physics is memorizing those little pieces. Uh, this information's handed down by some arbitrary authority and quite disconnected to the world outside the classroom. And novice, to a novice, physics problem solving is just about matching the pattern of the problem to all these recipes memorized formulas and recipes that you have. So that defines the novice end. Um, the expert is basically this practicing physicist. Uh, you know, they see the content of, of physics as this coherent structure of very broadly applicable um, concepts. These concepts are established by experiment and describe nature. And Expert problem solving is about using systematic concept-based strategies uh, and these are very widely applicable including into completely new situations and therefore of course much more useful than the novice based approaches. So okay so it turns out you interview these people you find out their beliefs lie in the spectrum you can then, and my, this is one of the things my own group has done, we, you, we developed a survey that allows us to classify then a cla you know, people in the class where their beliefs lie between expert and novice. And so then we use this just like the, the force concept inventory of measuring, you know, at the beginning of the class, people come in here presumably somewhere, somewhat over on the novice side, and we want to measure as a result of taking a physics course how much more expert-like did their, their thinking get. Well, that's what we want to measure. What we do measure, um, and we and now the, and the University of Maryland who does similar studies have this for lots of, of courses, lots of different kinds. So pretty much all, almost all introductory physics courses leave the students significantly more novice-like at the end of the course than they were before they ever started it, okay? So, and as I say, we've now moved into doing this, developing comparable for chemistry, and we're seeing if anything, chemistry is even worse than physics. So if any of you are laughing who are chemists here. Uh, uh, so this is obviously pretty disturbing because uh, for a lot of reasons, but I'll just mention one in passing, which is if those of you who are worried about the kind of anti-science movement, uh, if you kind of look at what a person's beliefs have to be to buy into that, they've pretty much got to lie in this very novice-like setting over here. So the fact that we're actually making people more like that by our teaching is very disturbing. Um, Okay, and I think I cut out how to fix that, but uh, I can, in questions, I, I'll touch on a little later on and you can ask me questions later on because we are, we haven't studied very much, but we are seeing ways to at least eliminate the shift downward, although we still need to know more to improve it. Um, okay, but I've gone through this, the, you know, these somewhat dis, disheartening results on research on what students are learning from the traditional science teaching. Um, but now I want to show you that it's 
you can you can understand these at a deeper level by looking at at studies in cognitive psychology, and it can also give you the steps of how to go uh, how to do better. It, it turns out that cognitive psychologists have done a lot of research on what makes up expertise and expert competence and how do you and how is it developed and it turns out that if you look across a very wide range of of disciplines and activities there are three consistent components to expert competence um, the first is experts know a whole lot about their subject that one's not very surprising obviously uh, but in addition Experts have a unique mental organizational structure for the knowledge in their discipline and this structure makes it so that they can be very effective at retrieving and applying this information. And third is that they have an ability to monitor their own thinking, at least in, their, in the discipline of expertise. Ask themselves, you know, do I understand this? How can I check my understanding? Okay. Now, what cognitive psychologists will tell you, and I think these classroom uh, study results just support, is the idea that, that this, these two aspects of expert-like thinking, somewhere above my head here, they're really new ways of thinking. They don't come along automatically if you just get the factual information, and that's really the that's really the implicit assumption of the traditional science teaching is give them the information and that's all that matters. Um, and what this shows is that clearly doesn't happen. That, that for this kind of expert-like thinking, it has to be developed as an extended, focused, mental uh, effort of kind of constructing that. And that construction is always built on the prior thinking of the person. And it's really, I mean, I would, I would argue that it's really biological that this is required because everything we think about of, of expertise is really things that are in the long-term memory. And to develop long-term memory, it, you know, it, you got to build these little proteins and put them into these structures. It's always built on what's there. It takes a long time to develop and do that. Uh, and so, you know, you're really changing the brain and you need to think about developing education and developing of ex expertise in student is about this kind of evolution of their brain to improve it. And in, in fact, uh, you know, well, over the past several years, people who study the brain are coming to see it more and more like development of a muscle. Uh, and that it really requires strenuous, extended effort to develop. Just like, you know, if I want to get stronger, I got to flex muscles, you got to flex the brain. Um, and so, you know, if this guy wants to, to get self-improvement, nobody would think he's going to get stronger by sitting watching somebody lift weights. And the thing that we now realize is that he's not going to get smarter by sitting watching somebody do physics problems either. Uh, you know, they, whether you're talking about mental development or physical development, both require this extended strenuous effort. And we need to think about the education in, from the perspective of how do we make sure that students will do that. Um, so before I move on to that, let me just, you know, review how this explains the puzzle that I started out with originally with the students. Is that with my graduate students, it makes complete sense because I now realize, well, they were doing great in these courses, but these courses were not effective at developing the expert-like thinking they needed to do physics. Um, but what was happening in the lab is that that was really, uh, they were doing exactly what this research would say is necessary for developing expert-like thinking. You know, that they were, we, we now see that effective uh, teaching is really facilitating the person developing their understanding, and you're facilitating that by getting them actively, 
mentally strenuous and engaged, and then regularly monitoring and guiding their thinking to become more expert-like. And when you put in those terms, you know, if you think about it, typical atomic physics lab, that's exactly what the students are doing all day long, every day. So it's it has nothing to do with the atmosphere in the laboratory, it's simply the cognitive processes that we're having them do are exactly what all the research set would say is what's necessary. And so when you realize that, you realize, well, okay, we just need to get more of those cognitive processes into the regular classroom instruction. And so I'm going to now talk about how to do that. And so one way to structure this is just to ask, well, what does research say in terms of looking at student learning? What does research say is that the, the largest amount of student learning and how is that brought about? And it turns out the best student learning de ever demonstrated comes from the expert individual tutor. And I emphasize expert. This is, these are people looking at, not at general one-on-one -on -one tutors. That doesn't, these are people who have certain particular characteristics and as a result their students learn dramatically more than random tutors. Um, and just to make the point of how good expert tutors are, they can really affect all students. Uh, and so if you look at the, there's one study i particularly impressed with, they look at the average where they took two classes, you know, a controlled group that went through the regular instruction, one class where they all had expert tutors. Um, they actually end up with the average of the class with uh, expert tutors was better than 98% of the class with standard instruction, okay? So that's really a big effect, you know, over all the students. So, but then they study what makes, what are the characteristics of expert tutors? And what I want you to see is how, A, these don't require one-on-one -on -one interaction. They might be easier with one-on-one, -on -one, but they don't require one-on-one -on -one interaction. And B, they exactly match with the basic principles of learning that I said coming out of this other research. So first, expert tutors put a lot of attention on focus, uh, on, sorry, on motivation. Uh, and there's a bunch of different aspects of how they praise people, how they pose questions, how they pose the putting things in context and so on. But motivation is really a major aspect uh, of, the, of the, the teaching. They worry a lot about understanding what the students do and don't uh, know. You know, rather than just thinking of presenting information, find out what the students know and so they can get a uh, timely specific feedback to them. Um, their feedback doesn't often, uh, is not just given, almost never is just giving them information. It's uh, actually through the form of posing questions to the students. And most of the time, most of the interaction time is actually spent with the students talking, you know, explaining, answering questions. Um, they're asking the right questions so the students are always challenged but never impossibly challenged so that they can continually uh, make progress. Again, you can think in terms of my weightlifting analogy. That's exactly what you have to do to get stronger muscles. Um, one thing that wasn't so, was a little bit surprising to me actually, until I under, could understand why, is they actually don't correct students right away. They let students make mistakes and they give them feedback in such a way as to lead the student to find and fix their mistakes. Um, and then finally another one that is important and often neglected in normal teaching is that it's not enough the student just goes through and solves the answer. There ha always has to be this reflection back where the students has to reflect on how they solved it, how they, how they made progress in this, and then summarize their answer, 
generalize, talk about how this might generalize to other situations and so on. So this reflection is a key element. Okay, so these are all things, like I say, uh, you can put in any classroom situation. Yes. Uh, can you save it till the question period? Okay. Um, well, no, uh, as long as they interrupt, okay. Um, so, yeah, they, they actually provide, uh, this is again somewhat surprising, they have very little, little praise and you never praise the student and psychologists also study this and tell you that this is really important in how people learn. Uh, never tell them, oh, you're really smart about doing this. Uh, and you can do this and so on. It's all about, you know, you worked, you know, it's obvious you worked really hard on this and you did a good job of, of figuring out the solution, okay? So it's not about them as a person, it's about the mental processes they're, they're using and the e effort they're putting in. Okay, so this is just saying this matches research from all different fields. Uh, and so, so if I get back to reviewing and just summarizing, okay, so how do you put these things in the regular classroom, not one-on-one? -on -one? Well, the motivation point is really important, talking about why this subject is, is interesting, useful, worth learning, uh, how you can make sense of it. These are things that when I told you there's some courses that don't get negative shifts in student beliefs, where we've, are it, where it's very new in this of trying to, trying to intervene, but simply making sure that that is explicitly done in, as each topic's presented, these things are covered. We see consistent measurable uh, improvements in the students' attitudes from that. Um, okay, probing where students are starting, are starting from and connecting up to that again. That's something you can do in any classroom. Um, this is where it's starting to get a little, uh, you have to think about it more, of how do you get them actively processing the ideas and probe their thinking. This, you have to figure out how to do this in the classroom because that's in a realistic university. That's where your main interaction is going to be happening. And so I'll, I'll talk about this more. But, you know, one of the starting points is you, you, can, you need to be thinking how you can not just have them listen to you, but you can pose challenging questions to them that they have to be thinking about the answers and responding and explaining to each other. Uh, you've got to think about how you can give them feedback on their responses. And the reflection, you need to have them not just go through exercises solving problems, but really reflecting on their learning. That's a critical element. Um, okay, so but most of you are thinking, how do I do that in my 300-person class? Uh, and those of you who are teaching a 300-person class. And what I'm going to argue is that, is that this has really helped, and in fact, maybe only possible with technology. And so uh, the last few minutes, I'm going to jump through some technologies that we've been working. There's some others. I'm not going to say this is all, but some that, that my group's been working on looking at, and then we have very clear demonstrations of these being very successful. Um, so the, the first one's the interactive lecture supported by clickers, and the second's uh, interactive simulations. So uh, how many here, uh, let me put it this way, is anybody here not familiar with what a clicker or personal response system is? Okay, everybody knows, okay, good. So, um, so the, everybody knows what they are. The, each in the class, every student has one. It's coded to them. So the instructor in using them would do things like, the, you know, posing a question like this to the class. And so then everybody picks their answer and the computer records who they were and which answer they picked. And then the class can see the histogram. Now, I want to make the point, though, that I go around and I talk with a lot of people who are, and a lot of universities are quickly adopting the use of clickers, and oftentimes they're not being used so effectively. And so I want to talk a little about what's important to make these things work well. 
Um, the first is, is the mistakes that's, uh, that's made, is that they're often used primarily as just an expensive way to take attendance and maybe test the students a little more often. And when you do that, the students are, get pretty grumpy about it because they have to pay the money for it. And it's of little educational benefit. But there's another way to use clickers. And when they're really used, and it's clear that to the students they're being used this way, to, to enhance the, the engagement and the communication between students and instructor and to provide feedback to them, uh, then they really have a powerful impact. And in fact, it really completely transforms a class. And so I'm just going to give you a few of the, the most obvious pointers here that have come out of a lot of, of observations we've done on looking at what works best. Uh, and there's a big long thing because I was working with about 20 people who are, who are faculty and people supporting faculty introducing these and surveying them and looking at different use. And so we wrote up this big thing. You can get it on the web. But some of the key elements that we've seen that are, that are important are and these are the most important elements, I should say. First, making challenging questions. Often a mistake is to give questions to students that are too easy or too factual. So challenging questions, they really have to think about. Have peer instruction, which really means student-student discussion, so that they, can, they have to talk to each other and argue with each other about the, the answers and why. Um, then there needs to be the right kind of follow-up discussion that really gives them this, this useful feedback. And if you realize one of, there's a couple of ways clickers are tremendously helpful for giving useful feedback. The obvious one is where you can see that histogram and see if 90% of the students um, you know, can't, are completely baffled by your brilliantly clear explanation. You can, Rather than just go on, you can try and do something about it. But a lot of people don't realize how the student-student discussion is so useful, too. Because, see, if I, in my classes, I actually have people organized into official uh, consensus groups. And so those three guys would have to sit there every day. And they'd have, on many of the questions, I'd say, OK, you've got to talk to each other and agree on an answer before you can put it in. And now I'm wandering around through the class as they're having these discussions, and I'm listening to what they're saying, and I can find out what things they're particularly hung up on. Oftentimes, things I never would have imagined was the issue, and it can be sometimes very, very small issues easily fixed, but if they're not fixed, they completely wipe out the rest of the class. So I get, you can listen in on those discussions, and then in the follow-up, bring out, have the students bring out the particular reasons they've chosen for particular right and wrong answers. And this provides f much, much more effective feedback to the students. And also, like I say, so they learn more, they get more engaged, everybody loves it. Okay. Um, okay, so the last couple minutes I'm going to show you the, my favorite, but this is pretty physics specific. These are these interactive simulations. We now got a whole bunch of these on a whole variety of physics topics and we're moving into chemistry and we're starting to move into other fields. Um, they range from the balloon and sweater that I'm going to show you, which is one of the simplest ones, up to a bunch on quantum mechanics. And for example, we have a rather accurate model, the laser, and so on. Uh, and just tell you, you can get these online. They're all free. You can download them to your own computer or just run them online because they're all uh, platform independent when in any browser. Um, OK, so how do these things work? Well, here's a balloon and sweater. So I can take this and I rub the balloon here, pick up electric charges. And so now it's getting attracted because the imbalance of charges. Pick up more. It's attracted more. Uh, you can see if I bring it over really close to the wall, it polarizes the charges in the wall enough so it sticks there, but you know, it gets a little ways away, gets pulled back here. 
So that's a simple one, but it's still fun to play with, and people actually learn quite a bit from it. Um, one of our more complicated ones, the circuit construction kit. Here you can build pretty much any AC and DC circuit you want that doesn't use transistors. I built most of this ahead of time. I just have to take one more wire here, hook it up, and nothing happens. I gotta close the switch. Okay, I close the switch, the light bulb. You know, electrons move, the light bulb lights up. I can increase the voltage, electrons move faster, light bulb gets brighter. I can, got meters here I can use. Um, measure the voltages, different places around the circuit here. And since I got a mostly physics audience, I can show you one special feature that I really like, but it's not so widely appreciated. <laughs> uh, but physicists appreciate it. Okay, if you watch the, the resistor band there, you see as the color code is changing as the, uh, okay. So these things can really do, and, and like I say, you can get very complex circuits. And uh, what's not so obvious to you is that we actually do a lot of testing. We build in a lot of the pedagogical principles into those, and the results are very, they can be extremely effective for uh, supporting learning. Okay, so with that, I'll, oh yeah, I just want to make one final point, which, so you do all these great things in a classroom, uh, it's important to realize that's not enough, and I emphasize this because an awful lot of really thoughtful, dedicated teachers put enormous effort into what they're doing in the classroom, but then the homework's kind of an afterthought, and it doesn't work that way, because I told you about how the brain develops, no matter what you do in the classroom, it's just not enough time for the brain to build those little proteins. You've got to have more extended time. So that means it's important to design good, authentic homework problems that will have the students spend many more hours going, having to exercise these expert-like thinking and then have some kind, of, some kind of feedback on how they do on that homework. Uh, that's sort of a necessary requirement. Uh, okay, so does this work? I said we should be measuring results, uh, getting data, and the answer is yes. And just here's some quick data comparing on what I talked about before, looking at some cases where one's implemented these principles into classes. Okay, so retention of information, okay, that's up, can be up enormously. This conceptual understanding gain is measured by things like the force concepts inventory. That's typically and now re reproducibly in many different settings can be two to three times higher than in using the traditional uh, approach. These beliefs that I talked about, the novice expert, there the, the standard is about a five to 10% drop. Um, this is an area where we haven't had time to study it as much, but we've just done some very simple interventions, what I talked about, of just explicitly addressing motivation and real world connection. And there we see at least we can break even or make small, Im small improvements. So, you know, like I say, it, to me, this is starting to look a whole lot like experimental science. You got principles that come out of research, you put them into practice, you get results just what you would predict. Okay, so I'll skip the institutional change stuff that I'm working on now and uh, end at this point and happy to, uh, there's some websites you might want and happy to take questions and arguments now for however you want. Thank you. Yeah, if you, if you can take this analogy with the muscle, and you mentioned the, the pure instruction as, as one tool to improve retention and so is it that you're really that you're really more efficient? Because if I do a pure instruction, I still I, I can't do as much of the other stuff I usually do in class. So in the end, am I really going to win by doing that? If I don't well, so effort, it, I yeah, mean, yeah. students will have to do more at home, say, for example. Right. 
other stuff you're doing is sending out information to them of which they're retaining 5%, then I can absolutely guarantee they'll be learning more if you do peer instruction and clickers than if you sit and lecture on it. That, that's, not a, that's not my opinion. That's powerful, you know, piles of empirical data saying that's the case. Um, but when I, but I'll, I don't think you have to leave it there. Uh, because what you need to think about is, well, how can I, how can I still cover the material uh, and still have them actively engaged in during class? And there you just have to realize that we're really stuck in some historical traditions. Uh, the, the lecture model came about because we didn't have books, okay? And that was the only way to transmit. Now, we've progressed a little since then. And so, I mean, any reasonable teacher would think that one of the things they want their students to learn is to be able to learn new things. And so why should I have to read the textbook to them in class every day? So, so in fact, uh, if you are having them much more deeply engaged in figuring things out, you can put much more load on them of preparing for class, having to read things ahead of time, putting problems on the homework that cover things they haven't seen before, but they now have the intellectual tools to go to the book or some other source and find that and figure it out. So, so they're both learning more valuable skills. You're using the time more effectively. So, I, so you actually, in, in some generic sense of education, you're covering more information there or more more material than you are if you just try and cover it in lecture. But the bottom line is, you know, all the data says that if you're just telling them stuff in lecture, it's not sinking in. So you can't really do any worse by leaving it out. <laughs> I mean, and look, I, it's quite reasonable to be skeptical, so do, you know, treat it scientifically. Go and measure just what's, how much is working is all I can say. Given that we're making a bigger novices out of the yeah. novices to begin with, what do these student evaluations mean in your opinion? Um, so that's a, I mean, that's a quite an important question. Uh, because it shapes a lot of what we do. First, it's very hard to be too generic about that because I've looked at some of the literature on this and I've looked at different student evaluations and at different institutions, student evaluations ask very different things, okay? And, and some of them are more meaningful than others, okay? So uh, they do, I think, tell you something of use. Uh, I mean, or at least a, a moderately to good to well-designed one can tell you things that are useful, uh, but they have to ask the right questions. Uh, but you also have to recognize as to what they can, you know, what students can and can tell you, uh, can and can't tell you. Uh, you know, they're not very good at telling, at being able to say, um, you know, this was the right material to cover. They are pretty able to reliably say, this class was really boring compared to any other class I've ever taken. And if you've got, uh, you know, 90% of the students saying that, then you realize, hey, that class ought to be worrying more about making the material interesting and motivating the students. So, so like I say, I think you just have to think I, I, there's a lot they can't tell you. There's a lot of things where, where we ask students two questions. Did you like this? And did you find it useful for your learning? There's many times where students will admit they don't like it, but they think it's useful for their learning. In fact, one of the great, co the great comments on clickers that we got from one student was, uh, where his class was using them heavily, saying, you know, it's, I, I think of clickers as kind of like broccoli. I don't like it, but I know it's good for me. <laughs> so, you know, and that was a student who 
kind of would have preferred to nap during class and he couldn't because of clickers, but at the same time he felt it was important for their, for their learning. Now, if you'd just taken a student evaluation that said, well, do you like clickers or not, and on that basis decide whether they, they were good or not, that would have been a terrible misuse of student data. If you asked them if they were useful for their learning, then in fact it's probably useful, and in fact students almost overwhelmingly say that they're useful for their learning. Okay, let's have uh, one more question. Uh, no, I'm, uh, okay, I'm not going to let you cut off questions so early. <laughs> <laughs> But don't forget there's reception afterwards. Right. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you, if you know, has anybody managed to quantify the difference between peer learning in class, what, like you described, yeah. and, for example, hiring undergrads to, uh, to run sessions like that at classes? Uh, yeah, so again, there's too many variables. There's a lot of studies about this that make what makes effective and ineffective. The, the peer instruction at class, what I look at it is, there's a lot of kind of things that come out of deeper group interaction. You're not going to get in class. What you're really getting in class is you're getting the first level of feedback. You know, if that student doesn't know what that word you, I used was, and so they're stuck, and he does, then that can, they can help, you know, provide that feedback to them. There's also a level of people gain a lot of learning by having to explain something to somebody else, whether nothing else happens, just the act of explaining it, the act of analyzing somebody else's explanation, okay? Now, in some sense, I could have a, you know, I, I could almost have a, a cardboard cutout and get a fair amount of that. Um, <laughs> But that's the reality, and that's a lot of what we use these for in class. There's a much, can be much deeper, but harder to set up and make, make work accurately of this sort of group problem solving outside of class. A lot of times people underestimate the complexities of making those work well. Okay. So the simulations you showed, how are those used in practice? What are the do with them? So they can be used in all different ways. We this. And we've got data on all these things. We use them essentially like uh, we can use them as lecture demonstrations. It turns out, except we've been able to improve on the real world in terms of some of the things we show. Uh, and so just effective there. Uh, but also then used on homework assignments and, and in recitations as sort of activities they'll work through with a simulation. So uh, all different ways. Uh, the way the way we when we when we're relying on them heavily, we'll first use them in in lecture and to to make points, and they'll you know with clicker questions and so on, and, and then they'll have to go home and and delve into them much more deeply uh, on some sort of homework problems where they'll, they'll get much deeper conceptual understanding and answer much harder questions. Which with the the simulation really is a support for them to explore and figure it out. Yeah. Um, does your research say about the efficacy of, uh, of frequent testing, um, having maybe a quiz every week instead of a final exam at the end of a semester? Does yeah. So, well, my research done, lots of other people's research that does. Uh, so, for retention, um, there's a big improvement of spaced recall, and so that means having to retrieve and apply some idea. Uh, if, you, if you have somebody study one hour uh, a week for five weeks and at the end of that and, and, you know, and, and through some test that they have to do that and they've got to retrieve and apply it versus having something at the end they put all that time at the end, okay, they'll do about as well or even a little better at the final exam there. Well, forget about the testing. If they had testing, they'd do better. But if you took out the testing and just study once a week, uh, they'll do as better with the block testing. But then you do retention studies three months later, they'll do much, much better uh, retention if it's spaced out. So there's a, there's a testing, but so there's, there's a spacing effect, but then there's also the retrieve and apply effect. So they're both, they both contribute there. Class exam and take home exams. Yeah. Typically, when you get a take home exam, it's 
It's a bit more challenging. We need to do a bit more research. And an in-class exam is a bit more focused. You have to know facts. Mm -hmm. so my question was, which is more effective in terms of a concept? Um, I it's a question of what you want to accomplish. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, like you've just summarized, you can ask different things on the two. And so depending on what's the most important to you, depending on the optimization of time and resources, that really decides that. There's no, you know, right or wrong answer. But if you really care most about a deep understanding of concepts, you're probably going to get it better from a take-home exam, but there's lots of other factors that come in. So, so the notion that retention learning should improve with smaller class sizes, uh, do you, any of your data support that? And then I also wanted to ask what your thoughts are uh, about the classic model of having a huge science class and, and then uh, separated into smaller classes run by TAs, for example? So, so first, I reject the idea that smaller classes are better. Uh, and I think that there's, there's data saying that that, that that conclusion is not correct. And the, the, the real issue is not what the class size is, but what's, what's the cognitive processing going on in that classroom. Now, if you're going to implement some of the things I talked about here without any technology, that's easier to do in a small classroom. But it doesn't automatically happen in a small classroom. I, I have seen, as a, when I was reviewing a department once, I sat there and watched somebody give a perfect classic lecture to three students. They sat back there, and he sat and wrote on the blackboard the whole time talking with them frozen in immobility, I'm quite sure they learn just the same as if they'd been in a 2,000 person class doing the same thing. So, so it, it's really the issue of the cognitive processing. We have one study and it's got a bunch of things, a bunch of issues with it, so it's not going to get published until we can reproduce it. But we have one study where we have a class that we compared a 20 person class with it's about a 250 person class where the 250 person class that was using clickers very heavily in peer discussion and feedback and, and lots of student discussion. And uh, that, the, the big class actually, and, and then was tested, a lot of, uh, a fairly rigorous testing regime. Uh, the big class did better than the small class. And it was because I think the, the small class instructor wasn't as good, couldn't actually generate as effective discussion among the students. But, but I think that um, one really has, that, you know, if you use technology well, big class, we've got good data actually on some big physics classes showing that we can get as much as high measures of learning in a big class really carefully designed uh, to make that happen as anybody's achieved in small classes, too, so. Yeah. We hear all the terrible things about lecturing uh -huh. and how bad it is. Is yeah. it really dispensable, or is there a role for lecturing in the classroom? Yeah. So, so is there some role for lecturing? Um, well, so you might accuse me of being somewhat biased in this, having just given a lecture. Uh, <laughs> And so I got to think of some way to rationalize that this was useful. But in fact, there is some good research showing that lectures can be useful, but they have to have the right preparation, OK? Now, and this talk, hopefully, uh, I mean, I still put in too much stuff, but, but hopefully a lot of things went into this. Namely, if students have been primed, so they have to have focus on a kind of expert-like framework for the knowledge. They have to be framed for some experience and some questions they come to the lecture with. And so they're prepared to learn. And there's work from Dan Schwartz has done some very nice work on this. Then if they get a lecture that, that you know, matches with what they've been primed to learn, people can learn a lot from lecture. And so in the clicker type classroom, I also don't advocate that you do nothing but ask clicker questions because 
it's if you set up the clicker question right and the peer and the peer discussion and so on, then you've really primed the students to learn from a 10 or 15 minute lecture that you would then give on the subject. So, uh, so it's not that the lecture can't work, it's uh, just that you have to, students, you know, anybody has to be carefully primed. And so, you know, that's the way I justify is I figure, well, most of this audience is highly experienced in this subject. Their interest motivated to learn about teaching and learning, and they've already come in with some questions, so hopefully some of them will get something worthwhile from this. Question about grades. So um, you mentioned that you have a Right. So, is it a problem? Yes. <laughs> do Do I have an answer? What one should do? No. That's clearly a, a that's a local cultural value question, and it's there's no right or wrong answer you can on that. Is there any research uh, about the effectiveness, effectiveness of uh, labs? Like yes. Yeah. So let me. Okay, I will let that be the last question. Um, so, so yes, I I have quite literally written the book on labs. I was part of a big NRC study group to look at. The research says all the research out there says basically that the traditional teaching lab is totally ineffective. Okay. Um, <laughs> It's an enormous, it says it's, we're just a waste, enormous waste of, of money and effort. It doesn't say that labs can't be effective. It says that the way they're being taught is when everybody's ever looked at them in a systematic way, the vast majority are quite ineffective. And the reason that just you can go, it's America's lab report from National Academy Press if you want to get the details, but the quick summary is the reasons for this are twofold. One is, and most importantly, the I made several reference to differences between kind of expert novice perceptions. The difference between the expert perception of what a laboratory is doing and students are to learn from it uh, compared to what the students' perception and what they're supposed to be doing and learning is bigger than in any other area of education. They're miles apart, okay? They might as well be talking different languages, okay? So that's one big issue. The second big issue with labs is that the, the educational goal is completely vague. People, people end up, can have goals of, well, they want to learn scientific method, error analysis, using fancy equipment, experimental design, learn the scientific concepts, et cetera. Oftentimes, departments can't really agree on what it is, so they just decide, well, we'll just do it all at once. The result is you do none of it, okay? So, so uh, on that happy note, um, <laughs> which, like I say, it, you know, it's clear that they can be fixed, but it's, uh, it, it's a seriously overlooked area. Okay, we'll have a reception at 6333.